Good morning, everyone, uh, from those of you joining from the US and good evening for those of you guys joining from China and uh, hello to everyone else all around the world. Uh, welcome again uh, to another uh, wonderful lecture that we have prepared at Yale Center Beijing. Uh, my name is Devin Lau and I'm the Assistant Director of Yale Center Beijing and we'll get started shortly. Um, I will just give a quick introduction to uh, the center and this event and then also introduce our speaker today. Um, so Yale Center of Beijing was established in 2014 as a gathering place for leaders from Yale, China, and the rest of the world to uh, join together as thought leaders um, to dialogue and to bring the very best that Yale has um, through professors and alums to share in China um, all fields of study, ranging from medicine to philosophy um, to the hard sciences to music to economics, et cetera. Um, Usually our events happen, of course, in the center itself um, in Beijing, um, but during this time of a global pandemic, which hopefully looks like we're uh, nearing the finish line here. Um, uh, we're not able to meet in person, but we are able to host these events, which we've been lucky to do. And um, we've had just as much, if not more engagement than before. Um, and so we are very glad to have you all here today. Uh, today is a very special event um, because I'm sure if you've been paying attention to the news, uh, there's been a lot going on um, in the US. And yesterday, of course, was the inauguration of uh, uh, President Joe Biden's um, first day. And so today we are able to have um, Professor Gregory Huber, um, who is the Force Family Professor of Political Science, as well as, as well as the chair of the Political Science Department at Yale. Um, he's also a resident fellow of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, as well as an associate director for the Center for the Study of American Politics and the founding director of the um, Behavioral Research Lab. So many titles, many hats. Um, his research interests happen to be in American politics and political economy, especially focusing on how the interaction among the mass public and elites, public, political institutions and policies explain important incomes. And so he is the perfect person to have today to talk to us about partisan animosity in contemporary America and whether the US is coming apart at the seams. And so without further ado, I want to welcome Professor Huber. Uh, thank you very, more, very much. It, good morning from here on the East Coast. Let me figure out how to get my PowerPoint started and then I'll just get going. Great. I can't see, I, it, Devin, is my slide up? Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay. So let me move this out of the way of that. So good morning. I'm, I'm planned to talk for about 20 minutes uh, and then 20 to 25 minutes and then be able to take uh, questions. So when I'm, when I talk about this topic, uh, I just want to start out by saying this isn't a partisan talk in the sense that I'm not going to suggest that one team is better than the other or one side is better than the other. And you know, as an, as an American citizen who's lived through the last eight years, eight to 10 years, it's been somewhat of a wild ride. And so I think, you know, having gone through this, there's a moment to just comment that it's, it's useful to take a few depth, deep breaths, which can be hard, not just because of the pandemic that's going on around us, but also because we've actually in the United States had something relatively unusual in our political history, which is an armed occupation of one of the branches of the United States government, the occupation of the US Capitol. But I, I like to put that in context of, well, what's changed in the last three presidential elections? So the first thing to note is that in 2012, President Obama, the Democrat, wins the popular vote in the United States by about four points, four percentage points. Four years later, in 2016, Clinton, the Democrat, wins the popular vote by 2.1 points. So, but President Trump is elected, a Republican, because of the way that we select presidents in the United States, we privilege uh, geographies. And so President Trump wins the Electoral College. So Trump does about 1.8 points better than did Obama, or excuse me, than did uh, the Republican in 2012. And then in 2020, uh, Joe Biden wins the popular vote by 4.4 uh, points. So that's a 2.3% swing back. So the, the, the central observation is just that there's an enormous amount of change in American government and American public policy associated with about four point change in what the average American is doing or a four point change in what the cumulative American public is doing in terms of which side uh, that they're electing. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I wanna to talk about two things. 
One is I want to talk about what are we fighting about? What is the nature of ideological polarization in the United States? States. And second, what is, what is going on with affective polarization? And so I want to distinguish for, at the forefront between fights we have that are about issues and perhaps the feelings we have about the other side, our affective evaluations, how much we like the other side. And when I define polarization, what I mean is the feelings I have towards one party versus the feelings I have towards the other side or actual differences between the two parties. So we're thinking about intra-party differences. I'm not going to talk about what is something else that if you're following American politics, you're well aware of, which is that the elites, the members of Congress, the people we think of as not ordinary citizens, but the people in government are obviously also polarized. And I'm often struck by the question of, well, who are the people who run? How do they look like the American people? And the answer is they don't. They're very different. They're much more polarized than the average person. But I wanna think about whether or not what we see at the elite level has spilled down to the mass level and think about what it means perhaps for the uh, stability and ability of our political system to function over the long term. And as I like to do, I'm gonna spend most of my time sharing actual research because I think I'm better qualified to talk about research than just write uh, you know, commentary for a newspaper. So you've probably seen a map that looks like this if you've been paying attention to American politics. And the idea here is just, this is a plot showing the American states where the states that the Democrats have won are colored blue and the states that the Republicans have won are colored red. And this is from 2012, just because it's a nice stark picture, but I could show you 2016 or 2020. And you might get the impression from seeing this map that Americans are at the point where those of different parties can't even live near one another. Now, this map is somewhat deceptive. It's deceptive in one way, which is it makes, it, it displays states by their geographic size, but not by their population size. So if we just adjust this map, for the population of each area rather than using geography, the country starts to look a lot less red and a lot more evenly divided, but you would still get the impression that people can't live near people with whom they disagree. Now, the problem here is that we're displaying data at a very high aggregate level, the US state, but there are in fact 3000 counties in the United States. And I'm gonna do two things in this next graph. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot data for all the counties. So each little colored entity here is one of about 3,000 US counties. The other thing I'm doing in this graph that's different than in this previous graph is that I'm color coding the graphs, not just red or blue, but how red or how blue. So the darkest blue areas in this graph are areas that are more than about 75% Democratic. And the darkest red areas are areas that are more than about 75% Republican. And what you immediately noticed is first, there's a lot more variation in terms of how blue and red the country is. There are very few places that are overwhelmingly Democratic or overwhelmingly Republican. And we're a lot more mixed up. You still see the same pattern where in the central United States, it looks very rare, red, but that is an artifact, in fact, of the same population issue. So now I'm just going to adjust this graph and show it to you on a population adjusted basis. And once we do that, the country looks much more mixed up. And so just it doesn't seem that at the basic level of who we live near and how our lives go on, that Democrats and Republicans are nearly so divided as you would imagine from that initial graph I showed you. And the same pattern holds within American states. So here is one particular American state from the Northeast, New Hampshire. And this just shows you that a state that uh, Hillary Clinton barely won in 2016, within the state, there's a whole lot of variation such that there are a lot of places that Democrats do a little better and a lot of places that Republicans do a little better, but there are very few places that are homogenous for one side. So even within a state, there's a fair bit of mixing. So I just wanna remind people that if you're looking or reading about American politics, the, the, there's not nearly as much geographic polarization as sometimes you would be led to believe by characterizations based on that first set of maps or even reporting about states 
where do Republicans do better? They do better in rural areas. Democrats do better in cities and near universities. And what I haven't shown you, which is interesting, is just where elections change. And there's been an enormous amount of change in the last eight to 10 years. Places that swung from 2012 to 2016, one direction, and from 2016 to 20 back the other direction. Okay, so that's just sort of a preface to get us thinking about elections. So the first thing I wanna talk about is this question of what, where is the ordinary American public polarized? And what are we polarized about? So a first fact is just that compared to the 1960s, in the United States today, our parties, people who belong to our political parties, agree more than they used to. And so the lingo in the United States would be that liberals in the United States are Democrats and conservatives are Republican. And it's not just true in the American South, where we used to also have disagreements based on racial policy. It's actually true throughout the entire country. At the same time that our parties have become more homogenous, fewer Americans think of themselves as member of either dominant party. So about a third of Americans don't think of themselves as a Democrat or as a Republican. So whatever the two thirds of us are fighting about, the other third don't wanna play. They don't think that they're part of these major parties and they choose to not identify with them. But at the same time that our parties are more starkly divided, the things that predict those uh, deviations are not what you would perhaps expect. So here is a graph that shows you how democratic a particular group is or how Republican a group is. So on the vertical axis, I show the proportion of a group that voted for the Republican. And this is from 2004, but it wouldn't make a difference what year I showed you. And on the horizontal axis is income, how wealthy people are. And what you see is that as income grows, it goes up, people become more Republican, but the effect isn't very large. So you might imagine that all low income people vote for the Democrats and all high income people vote for the Republicans. And in fact, we don't see that. The effect is at the extreme, maybe that as you move from the very poorest group of Americans who are about 60% Democratic to the very richest group they're only about 40% democratic. So you're talking about the effect of going from being very poor to very rich, only being about 20 points. So even in every income group in the United States, there is still a fair bit of heterogeneity in which party people support. And if we think about specific policy positions that people have and narrow in, we see similar uh, moderateness in the American public. So a, a salient policy issue in the United States is whether or not a woman should be allowed to get an abortion to end a pregnancy. So what do Americans think about this question? Well, about 20% of Americans believe it should be legal under any condition. So for example, they might support sex selective abortions or abortions late in a pregnancy. About 20% of Americans believe that abortion should never be legal. So it should always be illegal, no matter the circumstances, even if let's say it endangers a woman's health. But about 60% of Americans are in the middle. They hold opinions that we think of as somewhere between never and always. And they differ about under what circumstances they think that abortion should be legal and what circumstances it should be illegal. And this pattern is remarkably consistent over time, which is the vast majority of Americans are moderate. Now, you might infer from that that, uh, that Americans are moderate all the time, but that the parties are very homogenous. And so I just wanna show you how diverse the political parties are. Among Democrats here on the left, I have the question of on salient issues, how many liberal positions does the average Democrat take? You might imagine that Democrats are within the parties very liberal, even if independents are quite moderate. And what we see here is that on five salient issues, the number of positions on which, the de on which Democrats take all five positions, or they're also liberal on all five positions, is low. So only 15% of Democrats are liberal on all five issues. About a third are liberal on four of those issues. And about another third are only liberal less than half the time. 
So even within the Democratic Party, people who think of themselves as Democrats, we see a fair bit of moderateness. And we see the same pattern as shown in this right panel among Republicans. That is to say, there are very few Republicans who hold conservative positions on four or even five of these salient issues. In fact, there are as many Republicans who have only none or one salient conservative position as there are who have more than that. Uh, so we think of the elites, the elected leaders as very un uh, uniform, but within the parties, there's a great deal of heterogeneity. And on top of this, when we ask people, well, what do you care about and how confident are you in your opinions? Americans are quite willing to say they don't care and often they say they don't understand. And I think of this as the opposite of being very angry about something that you don't know very much about. Instead, Americans say there are lots of things that I don't care about and there are lots of things I don't know if I'm competent to make a decision on. That doesn't mean they won't give you an opinion. So if you give them a, a public opinion poll and you say, should we do A or B? They'll say, oh, we should definitely do B. But if you ask them, well, are you sure? They'll say, no, I'm not very sure. So a warning there is when you encounter survey data in which Americans tell you something, just because they tell you something doesn't believe that they're going to act on that basis or they believe it very strongly. And our focus on things we're fighting about often obscures the fact that there are many issues on which we agree. So in the United States, we used to ask survey questions about things like, should a woman be allowed to go to college or university? Should a woman be able to take a job without her husband's per permission? Should people who are of different races be allowed to marry? marry? And we used to ask lots of questions about communists because we were fighting a, 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 in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We simply don't ask about these questions anymore. And so we, because we don't ask about them, we forget that we now more or less agree. And so we've moved from issues in which we ask questions about things we used to fight about to only asking questions about things that we're currently fighting about, which makes it look like we're fighting all the time. And I, I think of an example of an issue that's becoming a consensus issue in the United States is, for example, same-sex marriage, which 25 years ago was something that among Yale students was deeply contentious. And now when you teach an undergraduate class, 85 to 90% of the students say gay marriage or same-sex marriage should be allowed. That's changed in part just because of generational replacement, but it was a big issue that we were fighting about for about a decade and a half, and it's gone away. I don't want you to walk away with the impression that the American public, however, is moderate, that on average people hold centrist positions. What we see is in fact something pretty different, which is that people hold extreme positions. They just seem to hold extreme positions on both sides. So our party system doesn't really allow people to perfectly match their political views. You get to pick more or less the Democratic or the Republican party. And I, I like to think about this when we think about two salient candidates in, in the last election. So we had Bernie Sanders, who was a Democrat who was running in the Democratic primary and Donald Trump, who of course was our incumbent Republican president, and both made salient economically populist claims about trade. So they both talked about trade with China in very populist terms. They were both in favor of trade restrictions. Now, they're on opposite sides of the political spectrum, and you could consider both of those candidates as taking relatively extreme views, even though they're on opposite sides, they're taking the same position. One might worry that, in fact, the, the problem is that we're living in not a world based on our opinions, but a world where we live and have separate facts. And so maybe it's not about our tastes or our leaders, but that we can't even understand what's going on around us. So I give an example of the following survey question. We asked Americans from January 2001, when President Bush first took office, to January 2009, when he left office. How has the unemployment rate in the United States changed? And Democrats told us that the unemployment rate had gone up by about two and a half points. Republicans said about one and a half points. And that difference, which is about a percentage point, is a very large difference. That's the difference between being, let's say, in a recession and not being in a recession. What's interesting is both sides are wrong. 
actually the unemployment rate during this period, during the Great uh, Recession, went up by almost four points. They forget that when President Bush lost the election in the fall of 2008, the economy was getting worse and it kept getting worse. I'm sorry, Bush doesn't lose the election. He can't run again. Um, but between 2000, November 2008, when Obama is elected and when he takes office, the economy is declining precipitously. So we read this and we say, well, are Democrats and Republicans, do they just have different facts in their heads? Because that would be really concerning if we actually believed different things about the, the state of the world. But remember, we're dealing with survey data here. So if you say something wrong on a survey or you lie on a survey, it really doesn't make any difference. But what happens if I give Americans an incentive to get it right? So what happens if I pay you a very small amount of money, let's say 10 cents or even as much as a dollar to get the answer right? And what happens when I start to put money on the table is that the incentive you have to just say whatever is politically convenient goes down or stays the same, but the incentive to get the answer right and earn some money goes up. So what happens when we do this? So we go from about 0.8 to about 0.5. So about a third of the gap between Democrats and Republicans can disappear if we just give people 10 cents to give us the right answer. 10 cents is not a lot of money. But of course, an incentive won't work if people really don't know, because if you don't know and someone says, well, I'll pay you to get it right, you don't know what answer to give. So we can also use an old way of penalizing guessing, which is what we used to use on standardized tests in the United States which is you get it paid for getting it right, but we'll actually penalize you for getting it wrong. And the way we did that is we said, okay, you can win some money for getting it right, but we'll also give you a smaller amount of money just for saying, you're right, I don't know the answer. And what we find is that if we give you about 10 cents for saying don't know, and let's say a dollar to get it right, half of Americans will admit they don't know. So half of Americans who ordinarily answer a survey question will say, I actually don't have any idea what the answer is if you give them almost no money. So this, once we account for this, the party gap drops to about 0.1 points. So fully 75, uh, let's see, 8.8 divided by 0.1 divided by 0.8. So 85% of the gap between Democrats and Republicans can go away when we give people very small amounts of money. And so this comes back to the point that people know that they don't know the answer, but most surveys don't give you a chance to say that you don't know. Okay, so, so this is about facts and values. I, I wanna spend some time talking about another topic that has been front and center in the United States. And that is a topic which is uses the label affective polarization. And that is the idea that I literally hate people on the other side. And it's an analogy that's often made to sports teams. So in the United States, for example, a prominent sports team is the Chicago Cubs, a baseball team from the city where I grew up, and another team, which is the New York Yankees. And you would in fact find people who would say that they hate the Yankees and they love the Cubs. And I grew up in Chicago as a kid, my baseball team is the Cubs. I might even say that. And the question is, should we think of politics like that, that you have your party, your team that you like, and you have the other team that you loathe, that you hate them? And why are sports analogies a good one? Well, because it doesn't really matter anything about the Cubs or the Yankees. I have these feelings about them. They're my team, but it's not the same team as it was 25 years ago. And I don't go to baseball games with any regularity but somehow I feel really strong allegiance to my team. Is politics like that? It's not about the substance, it's really just about what team I'm on. So one of the experiments we've run in the United States is to imagine that your son or daughter came home with, let's say the Democrat, Hillary Clinton, or the Republican, Donald Trump. Um, all pictures of Donald Trump that you find on the internet, he's smiling and they're big. All the pictures of Hillary Clinton are about this size and she looks about the same. So who should your kids marry? And if you look over time, in this graph I have at the top shown the proportion of Americans who say they'd be unhappy if one of their children married a member of the other political party. So back in the 60s, it's about 
By the time we get to 2008, it's about 20 to 25 percent. And in 2010, and even today, it's somewhere north of 40 percent of Americans say they'd be very unhappy or somewhat unhappy if one of their children married a member of the other political party. You know, this is akin to someone saying, well, if my child married uh, someone who watched a different baseball team, I would be really angry. So what does this tell us? So one answer is it tells us that people hate the other side. And we see in simple public opinion data, the proportion of Americans who say they don't like the other side has likewise gone up over, over time. So we have a question where we say, how warmly do you feel towards the other side? And this horizontal axis here is just time. And the vertical graph is just how cold you feel towards the other party. Republicans feel more cold towards the other side and Democrats feel more cold towards the other side. So how should we interpret the results? Um, now, one comment is no one ever comes home and says, well, look, mom, I'm marrying a member of the other political party unless they wanna make the other, their, their mother angry. So what, do, what does this tell us? What are we learning perhaps from someone's partisanship? The other thing about survey data, and the reason I think I'm generically skeptical, is that uh, it doesn't really tell you anything because it's costless. So it's costless to say that you, you hate someone in a survey in a way that it wouldn't be cost, costless to, for example, to refuse to hang out with someone just because they disagreed with you about politics. So I've done some work where instead of just telling somebody, hey, your, your, your daughter introduces you to a man she's dating and you learn their partisanship. Instead, we learn some other information. We learn their age, their race, their religion, something about where they went to school, their views about child rearing and some policy position that they have. So one view is it's all about party. The other view is that when all you know is party, you might say something about partisanship mattering, but what happens if I fill in some more of these details? So this is how much more people like their son or their daughter to come home with someone of the same party when all I tell you is about is partisanship. So it's almost one in, one in, one in two thirds points, 1.6 points on the seven point scale. So I feel much happier when my child says they're gonna marry someone of the same party. But if I include some other information about that potential fiance, for example, their character, their policy positions, their race or their religion, or all of these things together, we see the effect of partisanship becomes much smaller. So that's our way of thinking that partisanship appears to matter when it's the only thing you learn about someone. But when we fill in a lot of those other details, where somebody went to school, other things they think about, people appear to care about those things much more. And the opposite is not true. If I tell you about someone's policy positions, for example, their views about abortion or their views about mi the military, and then I tell you their partisanship, this green bar on the right here, then the effect of policy remains. So what looks like partisanship on the left over here may in fact be about policy. And so it's maybe not about what team I'm on, it's maybe about the actual issue positions that you have. Now, I wanna just close with another example. In the United States, there's even been some data that say that people find people from the other party uglier. That if all I find out, so I show you this picture and sometimes I tell you they're a Romney supporter and sometimes I tell you they're a Clinton supporter. And then I say, how attractive are they? And so this is a picture from somebody else's research. And you might adduce that, well, gosh, it's gotten to the point where we just think the other side is ugly. Now, the problem is, You've asked how pretty is that person, but they're not gonna answer that survey question. What they're really answering is they wanna tell you they don't like that person or they don't have good values. So in some work I've done, if I just say, before asking you how pretty is this person, do you think they have good values? I find that the effect of partisanship on beauty is reduced by a half. And so the implication there is people don't answer the survey question you ask just because it's the question you ask. They answer a different question. And so I just wanna give time for questions, but I want to walk away with two points or to you to walk away with two points. The first 
There is issue polarization in the United States, but it's not nearly as large as you might presuppose. The mass parties are pretty diverse. And when we have differences, they're actually confined to issues where people do seem to care a great deal, but they don't care about everything. They care about certain issues. And then second, that these prior estimates of affective polarization are likely too large. And I like to think of it this way, that it's easier to say in the abstract, I hate the other side. So you would hear an American say, I don't like Chinese people, or you'd hear a Chinese person say, oh, I don't like Americans. But in fact, when you would observe them interacting, they wouldn't feel that, they wouldn't behave that way. The abstract question is much, much easier to vilify the other side than the specific, than the specific question. And in fact, if we want to think about public opinion data, I think actions speak much louder than words. And when we think about the things that dominate our political sorting, it's not partisanship. It's things like our educational environments, our race, and our religion. And so I'll stop with that, and I hope to take questions. Obviously, there's been a lot going on in the United States that's not reflected in the talk, and, and that's part of what I'd be happy to talk about. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic and a very good grounding for us to sort of root some of our questions um, into more than just kind of anecdotal things. Um, so the way that this will work is anybody that has questions, feel free to either uh, enter them directly into the chat box on the bottom of your screen um, on the Zoom bar, uh, or you can also just choose to raise your hand and I'd be happy to call on you so that you can um, ask your question directly and interact directly with the professor. Um, and then I would ask that um, if you're asking a question or even just in general, um, if you'd be willing to turn on your cameras, that's always uh, nice because it's always nicer to talk to an actual person uh, than someone in the abstract as we've just discussed. So um, we would appreciate that. If, so feel free to go ahead and ask questions. Um, and I know it takes a while for people to warm up. So I think I'll get started with the first one. And while I'm asking people, go ahead and answer or ask your own questions as well. Um, so. Obviously, uh, you mentioned current events, and um, it it does seem that um, at least on actually, I would say you kind of cross out the the part about discussing about elite polarization, um, but it does seem that um, whether the elites are actually more polarized or they're just taking advantage of the fact that it seems like the general population is more polarized, that there is more polarizing rhetoric. Um, would you say, from your observations, that is? true and uh, if so then what accounts for some of those um, for the, some of that polarization? Sure so I, I think the first thing I want to do is I just want to set, set aside President Trump who I think for a variety of reasons was a uh, unusual president for us and was also much more willing as a national political figure to say polarizing things. So let's mm -hmm. talk instead let's say about the difference between the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. In the U.S. House, member, there are 435 members of the U.S. House, and they're each elected from a specific district, so from a specific place that represents, if my memory serves me correctly, about 300,000 people. Now, uh, so I have to divide, it's 340 million Americans divided by 435, and I haven't had enough coffee to do that in my head, so we have to do that. Um, one thing you notice about those figures is that members of the House, some of them are elected from quite politically homogenous places. And it's not an accident that they're more likely to say what seem like incendiary or outlandish things than American senators. American senators are elect elected from United States states, and each state elects two senators. So if you remember the graph I showed you, most states are pretty divided internally. So even though they lean Democrat or lean Republican, they're on average pretty even. It's not surprising to me that senators have been less incendiary or less extreme than House members because there are House members who are elected from places that are more that are pretty politically homogenous. Uh, that's one observation. Um, the, the second observation is we have had periods in the past in the United States that look somewhat like what we're going through now, where we have seen quite vituperative, quite angry rhetoric, and they have been around 
what I think of as more salient political issues than what we're experiencing now. So when you look at what Americans are fighting about now, uh, we're fighting about things like taxes. We're fighting about things like moderate reform to immigration policy. So I am struck that the rhetoric is somewhat out of line with what the actual issue conflict is, that the issue conflict is not as large as, it, um, as the rhetorical conflict. I think an open question is, has the air gone out of the room somewhat? Or will we see the same level of anger in our rhetoric when you don't have a president who uses angry rhetoric um, as we're, we've observed for the last four years. And that was just very unusual. Usually presidents serve a very different role, which is they don't, they don't lead, the, they, might, they don't foment, they don't lead, uh, and they don't, as national leaders, uh, speak in such starkly partisan terms. Uh, so then would, what would you, so obviously Trump is an anomaly in, in the whole you know, grand scheme of things. Um, but he's, I guess for me personally, I was still surprised despite that sort of, uh, inflammatory rhetoric that he, you know, had a relatively high number of people still willing to support him after four years. So, um, do you think that's an indication of anything that we should be worried about? Well, I, I mean, four years ago, I remember I wrote a letter to my children in which I commented, why did people vote for Donald Trump? They often didn't vote for Donald Trump because they liked the way he behaved on Twitter. They voted for Donald Trump because there were substantive policy issues that they agree with the Republican Party. And I always tell people it's good to talk to members of both political parties to remember that lots of people voted for Hillary Clinton, even though they hated her because they thought her issue positions were better, or they voted for Donald Trump, not because he was someone who had been married three times and says terrible things on Twitter, but because his tax policies and his regulatory policies they thought would be better for the American economy. And the political system doesn't really give you an option to say why you voted for someone, it just gives you a choice. And I think even in the last election, we saw something very similar where we saw lots of people who said, for example, the most important political issue to me is abortion. And I'm a conservative and I believe that abortion should be prohibited. And so I'm gonna vote for the Republican party even though I dislike Donald Trump. And I think that's one important thing to remember is that the vote doesn't imply endorsement of the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. All right, so we've got a question from Patrick here. And again, if people have questions, feel free to either raise your hand or enter it directly into the chat box. Um, you know, a lot of things have been going on recently in the news. So it's, uh, and it's good opportunity to get a direct answer from an actual expert instead of just random talking heads. So, all right, Patrick. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I, I, I heard uh, an argument that the, um, for a um, two-party uh, democracy to work very well, there should be some uh, polarization. If the two parties are going towards the center, that would, wouldn't be a good thing for, uh, for the democracy and for the two-party system. Um, what do you think? So, so in, in the United States in the mid-1950s, the American Political Science Association uh, wrote a report in which they complained that American political parties were not enough like European parties. They were too moderate. And they said it would be much better if we had two competing parties that took ideologically opposing positions and voters could choose between the two of them. And sure enough, the political system has produced that. And now we write articles that say, how come we disagree? And it seems to me that the, uh, it, it is certainly the case that uh, we have gotten what they wished for, and now we have to live with it. And it does look like a European political system to much more than it, than it used to in the United States. Um, what the, the one question that I think is difficult that I like to just remind people about, and I think I, I mentioned this briefly before, is that there are lots of issues we're fighting about and disagree about, but the way that the political system organizes those issues may not be perfectly efficient. So for example, imagine that I'm someone who believes that we should have 
uh, no restriction on same-sex marriage. So I'm a liberal on American social policy. I believe that the government should not regulate people's private lives. And I also believe that the United States should have free trade. So I believe that we shouldn't have trade restrictions. Traditionally, the Democratic Party in the United States was liberal on social issues, but conservative on trade. And the Republican Party was conservative on social issues, but liberal on trade. I had to pick one of those parties. So there's an inefficiency, which is that the political system bundles multiple issues together into the parties. And so I have to pick which issue matters more to me. And so I would say, yes, it's desirable that, that the parties offer real choices, the real problem is the bundling of issues because I can't unbundle those issues in a two-party system. Now, in a European parliamentary democracy where you have lots of different parties, you'll notice that you have parties that have all four bundles. So they're liberal on conservative issues, on economic issues and social issues, conservative on economic and social issues. And then we have the off diagonal that are liberal on the economy, but conservative on social and vice versa. Um, we don't have that in the American two-party system. And as a consequence, um, it, it, it means that we get this inefficient bundling, I think, that puts us in a position of, of looking like we disagree more than we do. Um, why don't I go ahead and, and call on, on Susan, and then I'll go to the, question, uh, the questions that are in the, in the, uh, in the chat. Great. Hi, Mr. Huber. I have two questions. First one is, um, I think Biden rejoined the WHO and Paris Climate Agreement on the first day. Um, it's a quite different action from Donald Trump. So will such kind of extreme polarization actions we're seeing in the political parties in the US lowers the development of America? Like you see, many of the Trump's efforts do not work anymore, right? And uh, my second question is that, um, is the actual vote for Trump in the 2020 election higher than the prediction? I heard some media said about such a statement. So thank you. Let me take those questions in the opposite order. So the United States uh, and, and most countries, in fact, are dealing with this question of how do you conduct polling, a public opinion polling, and how well does it predict what actually happens in subsequent elections? And starting in about 2012, but really brought to the fore in 2016, um, polling has given us poor predictions. And so there's a big concern about the ability of our polls to forecast what's going to happen. And I'm not a, an expert on conducting public opinion polls. I do a lot of them, but, but I'm, I'm not able to say like, if I did polling for a business, what would I say? We have a problem in the United States. The problem is that 25 to 30 years ago, you could randomly dial digits on a telephone and people at the other end of the phone would pick up, pick up and take a public opinion survey. And so you could reach an ordinary subset of Americans just by picking up the phone and randomly dialing. Surveys were a lot easier to conduct then. Now the problem is most everyone has a cell phone, particularly people under the age of 40 have a cell phone. Most don't have a physical telephone in their house and people don't answer the phone. And so the group of people who take public opinion polls has become less and less like the average American. And so if you want to conduct public opinion polling, your job has become much harder. And that is, I think, the takeaway point, which is that public opinion polling is much harder than it used to be. Now, public opinion polling in 2020 told us that Donald Trump would do worse than he did in 2016. They were right about that. They were wrong about how much worse he would do. But the pollsters knew they would be wrong and were very conservative and said, we think Donald Trump will be do you know, two points worse, maybe three points worse, but be very cautious in interpreting our estimates, particularly at the state level. And so Donald Trump overperforms some polls, um, but I think that we were much less surprised by this, and we know that we have an imperfect technology, which is public opinion polling, and we know why it's imperfect. Um, my colleagues who study China and who have to ha you know, try to undertake public opinion polls in China say, welcome to, the, welcome to the crowd. 
they, they've been dealing with this ever since they've tried to do public opinion work in China or other parts of the world. It's very, very hard to get to people and it's very hard for them to tell you what they really believe on public opinion polls. Um, the other thing that happened in 2020 that made the election somewhat surprising is how many Americans voted both on the Democratic and Republican side. We had our highest turnout election ever, despite the fact that we have a raging pandemic. And most people were worried during the summer that turnout would be way down, that many fewer people would vote. And in fact, turnout was much higher. Then you asked about uh, rejoining WHO and the, and the climate accords. I think that uh, that's certainly my, under, my, my expectation is that Biden is much more of a traditional American elite in terms of his view about international organizations and international cooperation. There's been some pretty good academic research suggesting that, for example, our trade conflict with China has actually hurt the American export market far more than we gained. And it, it seems to me that we're going to see this general pattern. Uh, I don't know, however, if that is for the long run, because certainly we're seeing more politicians in both the Democratic and Republican parties who are willing to question internationalism and multi, multinationalism as, as a policy tool. And I have other colleagues who are experts in international relations who can probably speak more to uh, the long run prospects for internationalism. Let me jump to the chat. Um, and I'm reading Paris's question. So, so I think the first question asks, you know, like, how can we stop Americans from dividing? And, and what impact will it have on, on, on the world? And so I, I think it, it was notable that yesterday's inauguration, if any of you watched it, that there were prominent Republicans and Democrats present at the inauguration. And I think there are a fair number of elites who understand that our ability to stand united as a country and get things done is lost when we can't work together. Now, does this mean we agree about everything? No. Does it mean that most elites agree about the peaceful transfer of power and agree about the threats posed by foreign adversaries? Yes. And I think we're returning, my hope is, to at least four more years of a little more normal. Um, I think, honestly, part of what motivates American elites is a fear of China and their view that if the United States can't engage in the world, that China will fill that role and the United States, many people in, in, in the United States want the United States to retain the leadership role that it's had since the end of the Cold War. Um, so the next question is, I wonder if scapegoating China for problems in the US really helps uh, candidates for, for both parties. So I think it depends on what you mean by scapegoating. Um, one prominent way of scapegoating that we've spent the last year talking about is COVID-19, where we don't yet, you know, first of all, we've seen a lot of that scapegoating go away, but we haven't had yet a full and complete understanding of how transparent China was about the initial outbreak of the COVID-19 virus and the degree to which regional officials perhaps were not completely transparent. Um, but I don't think that's scapegoating. I think that's a factual question. More scapegoating, I think, that's likely to go on might have to do with trade policy and the use of state-owned enterprises and why that might give country uh, uh, companies in China an unfair advantage. That might be an area of bipartisan agreement in the United States. So it may be that one thing that's changed is that's not a partisan issue anymore. It's a belief that one of the things the United States has to deal with is as in its relations with Europe, how, what, what's going to be the national line on how we deal with different countries and how open our economy will be. Um, there are no state-owned enterprises in the United States. And so what is it like to have a, a competitive trade environment in which countries have different abilities to, uh, to ad advance corporate interests? So I think that may be less of a partisan issue than it was in the past and more of a consensus issue. Um, 
Mo Mofi, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, asked, to what extent does uh, disinformation on social media accelerate polarization? Um, so this is a this is one where I am not an expert, but there seems to be a real concern that disinformation is making it easier for not the average person, let's say, but for relatively fringe people, people who are inclined to be skeptical, to avoid being exposed to reality. So you can avoid any, you can avoid mainstream news, what's actually going on, and, and be exposed only to people who tell you what you want. Um, it's obviously very hard to study this because a great deal of communication takes place privately. And um, I, I, I worry about this. I worry about this in part because the big change in the United States has been the decline of independent local newspapers. And so if you think that in the past, most Americans read about what was going on in their community in an, in an, and read about local politicians in a newspaper, um, the local news media market in the United States has been destroyed by the internet because newspapers used to make money by selling advertising and now no one goes to the newspaper for advertising. Um, it's in some ways the absence of local news that has led to us filling our, our knowledge of the world with national news, so not news about what's going on and social media. Um, I think this is an ongoing area of concern um, and we don't have a good answer. Um, one re re reassuring fact is that most Americans don't use social media for their news. I like to remind people that the number of people on Twitter is very, very small compared to the American population. It just so happens that it's almost everybody who's an, an academic or a college professor or people in this room. And we're not like ordinary people. And, and that's probably a good thing um, because most people are getting their news from TV. And so they're watching what is much less partisan than, than social media. Uh, Ji Hang asks, uh, to what extent would you comment that the Democratic Party has taken both House and Senate majorities would lead to more likely polarized policies? Well, well, clearly in the United States, having control of all three, both the, the legislature and the presidency means it will be much easier for the president to get things done. Um, there are still features of the American political system that make it hard for majorities to get things done. And one of the most important institutions is the filibuster in the United States Senate. The filibuster is a rule that says that you need 60% of members to vote to end a debate before you can have a vote on something. So in fact, having a bare majority does not mean that you can just do whatever you want. So it's not like a European parliamentary system. Um, I think it is much more likely now that we will get substantial policy change to take place. Uh, what that policy change looks like, I think is less likely to be radically liberal than it is simply likely to take place because it's still the case that you're gonna to have to get moderates to go along. Um, yes, so I think that's the answer is, uh, the, the other thing that matters a great deal is that there are certain things that are not subject to the filibuster and those include large budget bills. So at least passing the president's budget will become much easier. Um, but remember the Senate is still tied. So the vice president is going to actually have to show up to vote to break ties which means that's how close it is. And so it's not, you know, it's not unusual for a senator to, to, to die, to pass away. And the House has a similarly thin margin. So it's going to be very hard for Democrats to get things done. They're going to have to be very careful. Um, Jesse asked the question, uh, you mentioned the inefficiency in dealing with disagreement between the two parties. Um, how do, how do you unify both parties towards key issues that are related to the interests of the nation as a whole? So, so one area in which we've seen this, I think already, and this perhaps speaks to the, uh, to the role of President Trump, is that American foreign policy towards Russia is likely to change pretty radically in the next six weeks. And that's because the average elected Democrat 
And almost all of the Republican senators uh, view Russia as a serious threat. And while President Trump did not, uh, and because President Trump was the president, th our policy towards the, uh, Russia did not reflect the average opinion. So, so on areas where the parties agree, the, our political system is relatively effective at generating policies that address those issues. I'm not sure what other issues we actually have agreement about that are, are pressing. One might be trade towards China, where I think there is a feeling that their complete open markets are not maybe the long-term solution. I don't know what the alternative is. Um, that's, a, that's more contentious than policy towards China. Um, but a lot of other areas where Americans disagree about tax reform, for example, I think we're likely to see continued division that reflects the fact that Americans don't agree about what the right policy is. Um, so, Siong, um, again, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Can you elaborate on the polarization within the media in the United States? Um, so, in the United States, there are there are basically two types of media. There's the what we call the mainstream media, and then we think of the partisan media. So, the mainstream media would encompass most daily newspapers which while they might have slight ideological slant, they might lean left or lean right, subscribe to basic journalistic standards of um, reporting. And the idea being you, you report things based on factual evidence, you write reports based on facts rather than having reports based on opinions. Um, we think of that same mainstream media approach as characterizing the major network news, so ABC, NBC, CBS, and CNN. And then there is what we think of as partisan media or more, more ideological media. And on the right, the prime example is Fox News. And on the left, the prime example is MSNBC. What's interesting about that partisan media is that it's much less their normal news coverage and much more their uh, commentary. So if you've ever been to the United States or just watched Fox News, most of the evening is not taken up with news reporting. It's taken up with commentary. And uh, that is one of the things I talked about that you might be worried about, which is lots of people when they say they're watching the news aren't watching news, they're watching people just talk about politics. And those are not generally bipartisan conversations. They're not fact-based conversations. They're opinions, they're op-eds. And the good news about them is not that many people watch them, but it's still something like a quarter of Americans regularly watch partisan media, but it's only a quarter. Uh, it's certainly more of a concern in terms of its reach than is social media, simply because the uh, than than partisan social media, simply because many more Americans watch Fox News than are on Twitter, and the same goes for MSNBC. Relatively few people watch MSNBC, but many more people watch MSNBC than are than than spend their time getting their political news from Twitter. Yeah, Mopi, how do you evaluate the mobility of U.S. society compared to the 1970s? Um, the difference between the elites and the ignorant masses is enlarging. So I would, I guess I would, I would say there are two parts to this question. The first is, what's the difference in what people know between the elites and the masses? What's the knowledge? And then there's a second question about economic mobility. So the first, the, the first observation is that like China, the United States has undergone a vast change since the 1970s which is that many more people have gone to college and gone to high school. So the proportion of Americans who have graduated from high school and then the proportion of Americans who've graduated from college has increased substantially. So in fact, compared to the 1970s, many more people are educated in this country. And I read a fair bit about changes in China. Similarly, the proportion of Chinese uh, Chinese people who have graduated from uh, high school or the equivalent of high school and universities has increased dramatically. So when we think about one big change, it's just that the American public is much better educated than it was historically. So I don't know if I would be, feel, feel at all safe saying that there's more ignorant or more unaware people than there ever were. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. 
At the same time, economic mobility has gone down. And when we think about what we mean by that, your chances of moving up the economic ladder have declined in part because the returns to education have gone up so much. So if you do not have a college degree in the United States, your chances of doing pretty well in the economy have gone down a lot. But that's a universal phenomena around the world where the returns to skill and the returns to education have gone up. That, however, makes educational differences even more salient. And so if you can't go to university, you can imagine that it has political ramifications. And one important political ramification is people who can't expect to move up in the, in the economic system might be much more skeptical of the health of the political system. And so I think the decline in economic mobility helps us understand somewhat populism or concerns about trade because people aren't doing nearly as well off as they had hoped to do. Okay, I have a question from Bob here. Oh, so Bob asked the question like, how, how nonpartisan is the nonpartisan media in the United States? It's interesting. You can find reports on the right that characterize the mass media, the, the, the mainstream media as biased against conservatives. For example, they talk all about how terrible COVID is. They won't cover the Hunter Biden laptop scandal. And then you can go to the left and find the same reports that complain that the mainstream media, for example, covers protests against police violence and notes how violent the protesters are without pointing out that more Americans are killed by the police every day than were killed by, than protesters killed police during the entire summer of, of anti-violence, anti-police protests. So it, partially it's a question of like, how are we going to judge what the standard is for, um, for what it means for the media to be nonpartisan? And, and, and part of this also uh, asks a question about at what point in time does something become a newsworthy story? And there is a question of whether or not journalistic ethics are themselves biased towards the left or the right or just towards the government. So for example, if to report on a story, you need someone to say something or be willing to say something on the record, you can imagine that biases against reporting certain things that are critical of the government because certain people might not be willing to, to, to make those statements. So, uh, you know, I tend to think that there, there, it, it is the case that mainstream media is little c conservative. They won't report as much on fringe arguments. I think that's true on the left and the right. I do think that the coverage of COVID um, in the United States has tended to ignore how bad COVID has been in Europe and how good it's been in Asia. And so what you might imagine if you're an American that you'd think that the COVID pandemic has gone terribly in the United States, but nowhere else. In fact, it's gone terribly almost everywhere. It's, gone, it's going terribly in Europe right now. Uh, it's gone better in island nations like Australia and New Zealand, and it's gone much better in Asia and we don't know why. And actually that is one of our, I think one of the things we, we really need to point out. So I, I found that the coverage of COVID to be a little bit alarmist, but, um, but that's true of most public health coverage, which is it always focuses on the negative and it's, it's less good at the comparative, uh, comparative reporting. Abe, Abe asked, to what extent do you think that US teens are politically in, inactive um, and, and I, I, I guess the comment is they seem more engaged historically than they have been historically, uh, but teenagers are teenagers and they have a lot of other things going on. And there's a period of transition between into young adulthood in which most people become more political. That period, however, also coincides with many changes in life that make it harder to participate in politics. So Americans who are younger move a lot more, they go to university and they're working, they're working a lot, they're starting families, they're dating, all of those things distract them from politics. And so historically, younger Americans turn out at lower rates. However, in 2020, turnout among young Americans was up a great deal. So 
compared to 2016, there seems to be a great deal of engagement. And uh, so in the United States, you earn the right to vote at 18. And that's one of the ways in which we can think the political system doesn't give you much of an incentive to pay attention prior to turning 18. There are proposals to reduce the voting age to 17. And then as a, as a parent of teenagers, I might ask, do I want my 17 year old do uh, daughter voting or are they ready? I'd be okay with 17 year olds voting. My guess is few would, that they're still doing other things. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. Um, but they're not inactive. I think that would be, uh, I think that would be a mischaracterization. Oh, so Zoe asked, well, how does party identity interact with other kinds of identity? And, and I think this is one area that we're really actively studying in the United States right now. You might imagine, for example, based on reading about the gender divide in the United States, that 85% of women are Democrats and 85% of men are Republicans. But in fact, it's just that women are about five points more Democratic than you would expect and men are about five points more Republican. So even though gender issues were very salient during President Trump's presidency, it's not the case that men and women are hugely polarized. They're just enduring differences between them in their partisanship. Um, likewise, I showed you with about class that wealthy Americans are not overwhelming Republic, overwhelmingly Republican like you would expect if you thought they were just voting based on what was good for them in terms of economic policy. Race is a little more mixed in the United States. African Americans remain overwhelmingly democratic, but most other ethnic groups are quite divided. So for example, Latinos in the United States are becoming more Republican and Asian Americans are quite evenly divided. Um, so the parties have groups that are allied with them on average, but those divisions are not nearly as stark as you would believe from the way that we talk about the Democratic Party as the party of poor people, women, and people of color. That's, that doesn't accurately describe the party. I mean, Latinos in the United States move substantially right, more Republican in the last election. And that's a really main event point that the political system needs to be talking about. That's uh, contrary to this notion that it's about groups. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the Latino vote and, and why, I mean, it, it would seem, at least from a kind of social political perspective, it seems kind of unimaginable given the rhetoric of, of Trump. Um, well, I, I think that when you say that someone is a Latino or a Hispanic in the United States, that's an enormously large group of people. It's a little bit like saying someone's a European American and lumping together everybody who's emigrated to the United States for the first you know, 250 years of our political history. So, or 350 years. So in the, in the case of the term Latino or Hispanic, we mean very different groups. By far the biggest group right now is people who are of Mexican heritage. And many of those groups have been in the United States for hundreds of years. Those groups tend to lean somewhat left, but they're not the only group. There's a more recent group of immigrants from Latin America, as well as people from other countries, Cuba, Brazil, um, elsewhere. Those groups are not nearly as socially or economically liberal. And so when we call a group Latino or Hispanic, we're actually mixing up many different groups and it's very different the experience of someone of Mexican heritage in California than let's say the, someone, the experience of someone from South America and Cuba in Florida. And I think this is one way in which our, we would like to conveniently call people by a group, but they won't even call themselves by that group. So Cuban Americans do not call themselves Latinos. They call themselves Cuban. And Mexican Americans often don't use the term Hispanic. They'll say they're Mexican Americans. And these groups, they're heterogeneous. And then the other thing is that they're like a lot of other Americans, they're cross pressured. They might be low income, but many Latinos in the United States are Catholic and religious. And on that basis, they have conservative social views. And so our assumption that just because of the color of their skin, that they would be democratic does not seem to be true. Great, thanks. All right, uh, I guess, we're running up 
towards the end of our time. I guess one last call for questions and then we can uh, wrap up. I, I will say while I'm waiting that when I woke up and began this talk, it was pitch black and now the sun is up. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to breakfast. Yes. Uh, I guess it doesn't look like there are any pressing questions. Um, so I, I guess I would, I'll ask one sort of, uh, oh, okay, well, Mofei asked a question, which is actually kind of similar to what I was gonna ask. Mofei's question is, are there, uh, as there are so many factions, what's the secret to unite them as one? And I guess mine is sort of a similar question, which is, um, I'm assuming you've sort of done the analysis of all these different factors and, you know, is there a clear indication of sort of what are the major factors that affect how people uh, vote or uh, kind of perceive the parties? I mean, at least anecdotally, it seems, you know, people who uh, tend to be democratic are more socially kind of minded and, you know, Republicans tend to be more economically minded. Is that true? And, you know, what are all the different kind of factors there? Sure. So the, the Mofi's question was, what do we need to uh, unite us? And historically, the answer is we need an adversary. And the, you know, I always, the, the, the question is like, if you read American political history, one of the fascinating things to know is that prior to the American entry into World War II, President Roosevelt wants to enter the war and he's concerned about Hitler and he's concerned about Japan and is trying behind the scenes to support the Chinese nationalists and provide money to, to fight Japan and provide money to Great Britain. And there is a strong isolationist party in the United States that's doing everything it can to stop uh, American entry into the war. We now know that there were actually German agents running around the United States in the late 30s and early 1940s, providing money to support groups that were opposed to the war to keep us out of the war. And then what happens? The Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, and two days later, the United States Congress, or a day later, the United States Congress, with I think two no votes, endorses going to war. And so whatever isolationist tendencies existed were gone almost instantly. And so a common adversary is the easiest way to unite the United States. And that's been true for long periods of time. And one question is, why wasn't COVID that adversary? You know, mm. it would have been a moment for a president to say, we face an enormous common threat. Let us come together and work to solve this problem. And we can imagine a world in which our former president had done that and our former president was reelected by handy, handy margins for working to unite the country uh, against this adversary. Now, we didn't see that. So that's the easy way to unite people, find something they agree about. Well, it's much harder when we have to unite around things that we disagree about. And, and I think one question there is, well, what are the things that people are deciding on when they're deciding how to vote? And I think I divide the electorate into two big groups. I, I divide the electorate into a group of people who have an issue that they care a great deal about, and there's really only one party that's right for them. So if I am someone who is concerned foremost about global warming, and I think of this as the systemic threat to the United States and to the world. In the United States, I should probably vote for the Democratic Party. If on the other hand, my concern is the issue of abortion, and I think that there are more, you know, more people killed via abortion on an any given year than most other ways, and that's my single most important issue, then I should probably vote for the Republican Party. Lots of Americans fall into those categories. They know what party is right for them. But about a quarter of the American public could vote for either party. And maybe they vote based on specific issues mattering at specific times, or maybe they vote based on performance, the performance of the economy, the performance of how the country is doing in facing COVID. And they may be the most interesting group. And they're an interesting group because they decide elections. And I, and, I, and I like to remind people that at the end of the day, that's the group we need to study, not the group that I can predict how they're going to vote in 2024 already, because I know which party they're going to support, but the group of people who could support either party. And that's people, they care about abortion, but they also care about the environment, or they care about trade policy, but they also care about growth and they care about education. Lots more people are in those categories, I think, than we normally give them credit for. 
And one of the jobs of a political leader is to try to figure out issues where most Americans agree and emphasize those issues if we want to change policy. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank a you. most insightful talk. Um, our tradition is that I ask everybody to unmute themselves and to turn on their camera so that we can take a group photo uh, at the end. So we'll do that and uh, everybody can feel free to uh, thank Professor Huber um, as I un unmute you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and for those of you that are hoping to return to the Yale campus, I hope to see you in the fall when we can all be back in person. It's been a long year from my secret lair, which is my office at home. Um, <laughs> I look forward to the return to in-person interaction.